Biden actually is the precise combination of qualities that we need now, which is experience and a fundamental belief that unity is not an impossibility. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. Here you'll find extended versions of the interviews from my show on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I'm asking, how much do you really know about Joe? Joe Biden has had one of the longest political careers in U.S. history, and on his third try, he was elected the nation's 46th president. And there are plenty of challenges ahead for him. I'm talking to a man who has spent nearly a decade covering Biden. It's Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, who has just penned an important new biography, offering insight into how he'll govern a deeply divided America. Let's get to it. The G-Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. The book is called Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now, Evan Osnos staff writer of The New Yorker, and uh, someone I've known for a very long time. So nice to have you back on G Zero World. My pleasure. Thanks for having me in. Timely topic. Uh, You got that started. Uh, It was not in any way uh, presumed that Biden was even getting the nomination, never mind becoming the president. You know, it was the kind of thing that came together as it became clear that he was a stronger candidate than we might have assumed at the very beginning. But I've had this kind of slightly weird fascination with him for a long time. I mean, going back to 2014, I started interviewing him because he was involved in foreign affairs. And the honest answer is, Ian, that part of the reason I was going to interview Joe Biden was that that actually wasn't a very um, sophisticated thing to be doing in Washington. Joe Biden was not the center of the action. Not a lot of people really paid that much attention to him, partly because he was in the vice presidency, which is kind of a maligned office. And partly because people just took him as part of the political furniture here. He'd been at it for so long, it was easy to look right past him. Did he know all the way through that he sort of really was a favorite, that he had lots of structural advantages, or, or was it as much of a surprise to him? No, I think he came into this believing that he was the strongest candidate. And that was rooted in one basic piece of data, which is that the campaign, he and and the people around him, meaning importantly, people like Ron Klain, who's now been named as chief of staff, and also Mike Donnell and his chief strategist, believed that most Democrats still describe themselves as moderate or conservative Democrats, and that that really was the center of gravity of the party, even though people in my profession and elsewhere tend to focus so much on the on the progressive end, that is not actually where most Democrats are. And so that was their core belief. That wasn't necessarily going to carry them to the finish line. I mean, they were at one point so low on cash, they were just running out of money that, um, as uh, as Anita Dunn remembers, you know, she really ran the campaign. Anita called Joe Biden on the train one day when he was going between uh, New York and Washington. And she said, look, we may be out of money in a week and you're going to have to figure out how to pay, you just need to hold on to just a little bit of money to be able to pay people their severance if they're laid off. So that's how close it was to the end. And you know, I asked Ian, I I was kind of curious, how did he handle that? How did he take that piece of information? Because different kinds of political figures respond differently to the notion of failure. And she said his view has always been more or less the same, which is that he has suffered bigger losses in his life than this. And if if he lost it, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, How energized was he running all this way through? Because we know how deep the emotional tragedy has been. We know how much that threw him off his game. We also know, you know, how old the guy is. Um, And some people are incredibly motivated by the rallies more than governing, like our present president. Um, Others are not. And this guy has been an institution for a very long time. Uh, how, How did he gear up for this third presidential run at the age of 77? Well, he had more or less accepted the idea that his political career was probably over in 2015 when he gave that speech in the Rose Garden. Um, 
And yet then there was this moment when, of course, and he's talked about this publicly, you know, the, the sight of those marchers in Charlottesville for him really was a sort of call to arms where he felt like there was this moral emergency confronting the United States. I mean, nothing short of something as serious as that. And I think that was galvanizing to him. I mean, the idea that there was not just this radical danger facing the United States in the presidency of Donald Trump and in what he was generating in the population at large. But then also the, the, the political side of Joe Biden looked at the field of contenders and he thought, I don't think they're going to beat him. And so for that reason, it was energizing. But I think we also have to be realistic here. Joe Biden was helped very much by the fact that this campaign went virtual. Uh, in the spring of 2020 because it kept him off the road. He was sleeping in his bed every night. He was working out. He was giving the speeches to his fundraisers. They were disciplined. He wasn't going off prompter, to use the expression of, of what his aides sometimes say. So the circumstances conspired to help him at a moment when it would, it would help fill in whatever flagging energy he might have had. Obama, in the last few weeks of the campaign, was absolutely critical for Joe Biden. Obama was virtually nowhere in the early stages of the campaign. How challenging was that for Biden? I think there is a, a, a pretty multi-layered relationship there. It's not a simple one. I mean, the, 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 the nice version of it, and it's a real version, is these are two guys who never thought they were going to be particularly close. They ended up as a kind of shotgun marriage on the ticket in 2008. And they, to their mutual astonishment, ended up being quite friendly with each other in a, in a deep way. I mean, when Bo Biden got sick, uh, Barack Obama told Joe, do not take out, you know, a loan to pay for these medical treatments if you need help or to keep the family actually really afloat. I'm going to give you the money. And Biden didn't end up needing it. But there was a real relationship there. And then there was the problem, which is Barack Obama believed that Hillary Clinton was in many ways the natural heir to the Obama administration. And he made that his choice in 2016. Uh, obviously, Biden didn't run. And then you get to 2020. And I think there was, to some degree, a feeling that Obama had, how would I put it? I guess I would say that Obama understood that the best chance to secure his legacy and to secure the future of the Democratic Party uh, was to make sure that Joe Biden won this race. Um, but he also looks at the field and he sees that there are contending voices that look more like the future of the country than the past. And he wasn't going to come out too early and signal that he didn't think there should be a legitimate discussion within the party about who is the face of the Democratic Party. Once it became clear it was Joe Biden, he gave it him his full support. So if that relationship, that personal relationship, um, you know, sort of in the in the midst of, you know, the, the, the two Obama terms was a 10, what is it now? It's a 10. I mean, let, let's be clear. This is a moment in which the vice president who helped Barack Obama succeed in very specific ways. I mean, we forget this, but like in 2009, Joe Biden was the one who lobbied Arlen Specter to change parties and become a Democrat, which then helped uh, Barack Obama succeed. He was the one who called up and got uh, he, he called six members of the Senate to try to get votes on the stimulus bill. Biden got three votes and the bill passed by by three votes. So there, there is actually like real strategic collaboration there that is the basis of this. And I think if you really pressed President Obama on it and had a frank conversation about whether or not it was a mistake to side with Hillary Clinton early in the 2015, 2016 cycle, that would be an interesting one. That's not a conversation I've had. But what I have had is a conversation with President Obama where I said, you know, in what way do you think Biden is fit for this moment? And what he says is that he thinks that Biden actually is the, the precise combination of qualities that we need now, which is experience, uh, also a political awareness of how to work with Congress and a fundamental belief that unity is not uh, an impossibility. So, I mean, having now spent a lot of time with a professional career politician, um, an unusual thing in any circumstance. What has surprised you most about the man, about what drives him, about how, you know, how your personality is molded, is, is shaped 
by, by that kind of thing you choose to do with your life. You know what surprised me, Ian, was that when we hear about Joe Biden, the, the image that we usually get is the, as a British diplomat put it to me, uh, the spigot that you can turn on, but you can't turn off. The guy who will speak to fill whatever space is available. And what you actually find is that at this stage in his life, here he is in his eighth decade, when a lot of people are, frankly, in more of a broadcasting mode than a listening mode, he's actually become a more attentive listener, a person that is actually more inclined to want to pick up information that he doesn't already have than he was 20 years ago. That's the surprise, that some of that, you know, that bumptious ambition that was so much a part of his profile for years and years, it, it finally settled down and... I think getting as close as he has now, of course, being at the center of history, he comes to it at a time in his life that is, he's, it's sort of a mature season. And he is not anymore the guy who will just speak to try to uh, muscle his way through a setting. He's, he's very often looking around for that thing he can pick up that he doesn't quite know and that he thinks you know. I came to think of it as a sort of productive insecurity. And it's something that might serve us well at the top of the U.S. government right now. Is, is that where climate, for example, is coming from? Because obviously a, a very different profile for him um, than it was when he was vice president. And indeed, in a campaign where he was taking virtually no risks, he, he made a number of statements that obviously were planned um, that, that led to a fair amount of blowback uh, in terms of this transition away from oil and gas. Yeah, I think climate is an area in which he sees a clear opportunity to be progressive. And, you know, part of the problem we've all been contending with is how do you make sense of the fact that he seems like a total centrist on Monday and then sometimes he talks about being the most transformative president since FDR? The way he squares these is by saying there are issues on which I think we are in agreement and able to make substantial progress. And then there are areas where we can't. Like he is not going to wake up tomorrow as being the Medicare for all president. That's not where he thinks the American public is. He doesn't have a plan for that, to borrow the expression. But where he does think we can we can be aggressive is on climate. But it is a true statement. He, he's not he's not lying when he says to the state of Pennsylvania and elsewhere uh, that he's going to ban that he's not going to ban fracking. But he is also serious when he sees where the future is going, and he's going to use what he can, even in the constrained circumstances of potentially a Republican Congress, to use the power of the pen and see what he can get done on climate. I think it's worth pointing out, Ian. He also sees climate as part of the foreign agenda here, part of America's overall standing in the world. There is no way to be an exceptional country, an indispensable country, if you are in fact uh, not participating in modern climate science. And that's part of the project. Now, most of what President Trump uh, tried to use um, to beat on Biden, you know, sort of bounced off, right? Because I mean, you know, there, there weren't the obvious negatives uh, that there were with Hillary Clinton, for example. But the one that did stick um, was Sleepy Joe. The one that did stick was the incoherence. So you've spent a lot of time with him. Talk about that. What I find interesting, and I was hearing some of the same kind of reflections from people, also particularly around the world. You know, people, I think uh, in other foreign capitals, you were, I was often getting that question from people, which is how, how sharp is he? And there's a couple of important details I think that are worth pointing out. For one thing, he came into this race in the beginning, in, in beginning of, in sort of 2019, out of shape. I mean, out of, he wasn't tuned up as a political figure. He'd, he'd spent what can be sort of the most destructive period for a candidate, which is to say he'd spent it in semi-retirement as the boss of bosses, nobody ever cutting him off, nobody ever debating him, nobody ever criticizing him. All of a sudden, he's back into the trenches, and he has to, he he has to get tuned up. And he discipline in the best of times around that kind of thing. Right? And that's the second piece. That's the key piece of this, is that I think for people who are tuning into Joe Biden now, what they see is a man who, to borrow James Comey's expression, will start a conversation in direction A and end it at direction Z. But what we also know is that if you've been looking at Biden over the long term, 10, 20, 25 years, he has been accused of versions of that forever. That's partly how his mind works. It's partly because he doesn't use a prompter. He doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable. It goes back to having the stutter. Um, but he is, look, he moves more slowly across the stage. His voice is clearly raspier. 
But if you listen to his interviews, real interviews, I mean, in-depth interviews, what you find is that his mind is unchanged from where it was a few years ago. Is your sense, this is a guy who's thinking this is a one-term thing? I don't get that sense, actually. And I think part of that is, you know, his political nerve endings tell him that the moment that he signals that uh, this is a one-term thing, that cuts his legs out from under him. All we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about is who's next. And so he's, he's sort of in some sense, you know, it's political malpractice 101 for him to do that. Um, but I also think there's another piece of this. I've talked to him about the decision about when do you retire? When do you hang it up? And his belief is partly rooted in the idea that he looks back on his own father and he sort of had lobbied his dad to retire and he thinks that was a mistake. So he kind of pushed him out of it before he, he should have. And what he says is, look, take a look at me. And if I look like I'm losing a step, then it'll be time to be done. But, you know, there was a point when I was reporting this book when I made it clear to the campaign that I said, look, if he's going to be a one term president, he knows it now. I need to know that because that's going to be an important piece of how people evaluate him. And they said, we, this is not a charade here. Like we are not actually hiding something. That is not how he thinks about it. So I, I came away reasonably convinced on the political merits that he has not made that choice. Now, uh, let's go to foreign policy for a little bit, which, you know, you and I spend a lot of time on. You know, your previous life uh, was in Beijing. Um, and, you know, I remember when Biden was first announcing his run, and one of the things he said was that China wasn't really a threat, that Russia's a threat and China's, I mean, come on, they don't, they don't have any capabilities with the United States. Where is Joe on China right now? And, and has there been a lot of inconsistency there? I think the language that we heard in the beginning, and you, you framed it correctly, where he said, we don't have to worry about China, it's not a competitive threat. You know, I think that was a kind of misguided form of American chest thumping. It was essentially like, you know, hey, we've still got all of the innovative vigor and they don't have it because they don't have the culture. That is a, a, a that's a, a bit of an old standard that he was pulling off the shelf, but that's not an up to date view. And it's not actually how he and his China team talk about it now. But even as vice president, like in 2016, I, I was kind of stunned that he could have a view like that in 2019. Yeah, I think that there are, you know, he's not the first person in Washington to get locked into a conception of a complex issue like China and then more or less, you know, dine out on it ever since. I don't think that's the view that he holds now. I think what you hear from him and I've talked to I've talked to him about China is that he looks at it and he basically believes that China has made mistakes in its own foreign policy in its relationship with it, with its neighbors. The United States is not the only relationship that China has problems with right now. If you look around the G7, you look around the neighborhood, it has some serious problems. And I think that's a that's a hint about how he sees the United States uh, leveraging that moment um, to refortify our own relationships and to isolate China. So where do you think, I mean, if we, if we were coming back to this conversation in six months time, where do you think we would see the most significant early stage differences in the foreign policy arena? Well, to begin with, I think if you take trade, the United States is not going to be fighting a trade war with Europe at the same time that it's trying to, you know, reimagine its relationship with, with China. So... I, you know, to state the obvious, and you know this as well as I do, this is going to be a period of reintroducing ourselves to our allies, going out and saying, what can Germany and the United States do together that they can't do independently when it comes to forcing China's hands on market access issues, intellectual property issues. But what I also think is significant to point out is they're not going to roll back tariffs on day one of the Biden administration. The Trump administration, for all of the kind of chaos and improvisation that went into its China policy, and I use those words advisedly, actually has given the Biden administration something of of leverage to be able to deploy on its own schedule. They can come in and decide when and where they want to relieve the pressure. And that gives them a hand to play. They don't have to roll back tariffs. They can wait until they get some serious concessions out of the Chinese side. And... When I look more broadly at the fact that the United States has damaged its credibility internationally, I mean, you know, leaving the Iranian nuclear deal and leaving the Paris Climate Accord, do you think that's something he feels like he needs to address in a proactive way? And if so, how might he do it? 
I don't think you're going to hear him going out and saying that the philosophy of the Obama administration, let you know, don't do stupid stuff, was a mistake. He he draws energy from that period. He believes that they were fundamentally facing in the right direction. Um, but he also looks at the world now. And if you pay close attention to what he's saying and what some of his advisors are saying, they recognize that the world has changed since they left office and they can't imagine going in and just trying to sort of wave the flag of American exceptionalism again. That's not going to work. You have to recognize where you are, the diminished position the United States is in. And it's, you know, it's not enough. They don't want to be complacent and say, all right, we're going to slink back into the pack and accept the idea that there's no longer any leadership role for us. But they also can't go in and simply say, we're back and we're as strong as ever. The world has changed as a result of the last, call it more than four years, really sort of the last eight years. Uh, and I think, I think that what you find is a, um, a humbled sense, not only of what the U.S. democracy looks like to the rest of the world, uh, but also what the United States has to say and what it has to offer. You know, he comes in. I, I often Ian, find myself identifying this kind of fusion between Biden's personal story and his political ideas. He is a humbled man at this point in his life, humbled by the fates, to be perfectly blunt about it. The death of his son, Bo, the ups and downs, losing presidential races along the way. And he comes to it at a moment when the United States should, frankly, be humbled, too. I mean, here we are flat on our backs with the COVID epidemic, incapable of bringing even basic public health resources to bear. And he has to go out into the world and say, yes, we have made terrible mistakes in our recent past, but there is things that we can do and things we want to do. And we plan to return to the world community. Leaving aside climate, if he was going to surprise us in domestic orientation, as a president, it would be where? I think if he's going to surprise you, it may be on his um, recognition of the scale of the crisis around income inequality. Because in so many ways, the, the various things that beset this country come back to that basic failure to provide opportunity to people. And that doesn't mean he's going to you know, come in tomorrow and introduce a wealth tax. But he cannot have a successful presidency without acknowledging the full scale of the ways in which the economic system is simply not working for people across the board. And it's not him saying it. It's, you know, as you and I both know, it's now CEOs who are looking down the down the uh, runway and seeing where the future of the American economy is. So he's going to have to contend with that. I will tell you, Ian, one of the most interesting conversations I ever had with him was before Bernie Sanders was on the scene before Donald Trump was on the scene. In 2014, I was talking to Biden about politics and he said, look, I think the economic picture in this country is really rough for working people and the Democratic Party is failing them. We're not doing enough. And at the time, I honestly, Ian, didn't understand enough about what he was talking about to realize that he was onto something. And I didn't quote it at the time. I didn't get it. Of course, what he anticipated was what Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders later picked up on. So that is core to who Biden is. And I would expect him to be fairly active when it comes to trying to reform this economy to make it more productive for, for a wider swath of Americans. How do you think he's going to deal uh, with the fact that he's going to put a nationwide mask mandate in place and a whole bunch of governors in the worst hit states are going to say no mas? Uh, how does he deal with the fact that in the biggest crisis of our lifetimes, and he said the president doesn't have a plan, but the reality is the president doesn't have all that much power. How does he deal with that? I think he's, he's relying on what would be described as the reality-based community. You know, that's the term that we remember from the Bush administration that was used with contempt. And what the COVID epidemic has shown us is there is only so far that you can try to outrun the facts, the cold, hard, blunt reality of science. And at a certain point, it comes back and it kills people in your state. And if there are governors who are going to continue to reject the basic legitimacy of masks, at a certain point, there's only so much Joe Biden can do. He can, he can give them the science. He can empower his, his federal resources to make smart, impartial, apolitical decisions. But if people are incapable of following them, that's the limits of his power and, and, and he'll move on and he'll talk to the people who are willing to be saved. Now, he becomes president. Trump is there. 
He's going to be throwing fusillades with a, a media reach that is well beyond anything that we have experienced from a former president in our lifetimes. Um, the right thing for Biden to do is to ignore it. Uh, hard to do that hard to do that in lots of ways. Um, how do you think he's going to deal with ex-President Trump? How's he going to deal with the extraordinary calls to, to lit, you know, to, to op for cases to be open, um, you know, for, for trials to proceed, for us to litigate, you know, so many calls of illegality all the way through or, and, and, and at the same time, you have, um, you know, Biden reaching out uh, and saying, I, I want Trump supporters to, to be part of the same country and we all have to come together. I think that uh, to begin with, when it comes to Trump himself, Biden's approach is becoming visible to us now. If, if you look at the way he has contended with Trump in this strange interregnum of kind of refusing the reality of the results of the election, his approach has been what I would describe as kind of pitying disregard, in effect saying it's embarrassing, uh, it's bizarre, uh, my word, not his, but not allowing himself to get drawn into the invention of a dispute. Trump thrives on the creation of conflict. And for there to be a conflict, you have to participate in it. And the truth is the law is on Biden's side, and that gives him the insulation of being able to say of Donald Trump, uh, good luck to you. Now, I think the reality is, that in the world that Biden will be dealing with, there's going to be a pretty heavy demand for some kind of reckoning, some kind of accountability with this process. But Biden has also made clear, and I, 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 this is a deeply felt view, that if Biden allows himself to become personally involved in talking about prosecutions of former presidents or even members of the administration, that you're falling into precisely the kind of degrading uh, indignity that was such a hallmark of the Trump years in which you had a president talking about locking people up. Biden's view is we got prosecutors to do that. But what he has said is we're going to appoint an attorney, sorry, an inspector general who is going to be responsible for probing the use of stimulus funds. And that is the beginning of a process. And if those lead to prosecutions, so be it. But he's trying to be in so many ways the opposite of Trump. And that requires him to use the institutions available rather than uh, dipping into the emotional reservoir that Trump uses so effectively. Does that also mean personally staying away from considering a pardon? I would be surprised if he pardons Donald Trump. I don't think that's in the cards. What about Mr. McConnell? What about um, a country that is so incredibly divided that is likely to still have a Republican Senate, though we won't know that until early January? Uh, you know, Joe Biden certainly knows Senate and knows McConnell better than almost any other living politician. But, you know, while Biden was vice president, these same cast of characters did everything possible to stop them from governing. Should our baseline expectation be it's the same thing? I think that should be our baseline expectation. Look, the, the GOP has indicated no interest in meeting Biden in some arena of cooperation. I mean, at the moment, they're participating in the fiction, by and large, uh, that there is still a pathway for Donald Trump. But I think if you get past the theater for a second, you see that there is something deeply different in the relationship that Biden has with McConnell uh, that Obama never had with McConnell. And, you know, I, I don't want to disregard completely the fact, for instance, Mitch McConnell was the only Republican senator who showed up at the funeral at the for funeral. Joe Biden in 2015. That's right. I remember that. Absolutely. Mitch McConnell once called Joe Biden's office in the West Wing got Biden on the phone and said, is there anybody over there who knows how to make a deal? And these two guys then got into a negotiation. They ended up coming up with the deal to avert the fiscal cliff, a deal that was unpopular, I should point out, with a lot of Democrats. Um, but the point was that they did find some basis for at least a negotiation and ultimately a deal. Those kinds of connections, that, that background to the relationship is at the core of Biden's governing philosophy. Evan Osnos, the book is Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. Thanks a lot for being here. My pleasure, Ian. Great to be with you.
That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Like what you've heard? Come check us out at gzeromedia.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.